Now I have to fix the recording because otherwise it's going to be do, do, have to do it again. All right. Yeah, I think it's good now. So yeah, what I'm what I'm saying is that there is this mutation applet which is available. I I have linked it from the class website. So I want to show you. Uh, hopefully you can see this as well. Basically, yeah, it's there is one in JavaScript where you can just so you can create a quiver and then you can kind of go. So I'm going to mutate three, two, four, five, six, and then it just does it for you. And so you keep mutating, or you can also ask to like do 15 mutations at random, and then you're going to get this. So, anyways, the uh, you can save yourself a lot of work with the mutations, and then there's also the Java version, which uh, you can uh, download, and etc. And the Java version has an, a lot of a lot of other things. Wait, am I listening? Okay, uh, hold on, let me mute. Uh, mute. Okay. Yeah, so um, the Java version has many more uh, things. Like you can look at the cluster variables, how they mutate as well. And you can also find the mutation class of your quiver, check if it's, or not the whole class if it's infinite, but it's, if it's finite, it can compute the whole class and maybe find some acyc acyclic or tree-like quiver in it, and etc. So that's, uh, but, but before I told you about the software, I, you, you have to do a certain amount of mutations yourself so that you are now comfortable and know what's going on. And so another, Another thing I want to mention is that there is this book by Robert Marsh, which I'm going to be following for the root systems, because there is no root systems in our main book by Fomin and Williamson Vilovinsky. So, uh, book by Marsh. So if I mean it's a I have it printed. Well, I have the I have purchased an actual book, but if you need to take a look at the electronic version, let me know. Uh, okay, so that's uh, that's basically, these are the logistical comments. Do you have any questions about this or about the homework or anything else? All right, no questions. Now, let me remind you what I did last time. Last time I was explaining root systems. So a root system is basically, is a, it's, is a finite subset R of some vector space V. And kind of the main condition is that uh, main condition is uh, is that if you take any root, any root beta, and apply a reflection with respect to another root alpha, then the result also belongs to your root system. Sorry, it's uh, it's supposed to be phi. Uh, if alpha and beta, alpha and beta belong to phi, and so that's why the root systems are very highly symmetric, and so. Given a root system, you can. Last time I, I also explained there is there is a correspondence between root systems and finite reflection groups, and also that you can choose a simple system. Uh, simple system uh, delta, and no matter which one you choose, it doesn't really matter. They're all related by the action of this reflection group. And yeah, so that's basically that's basically it for root systems. And so now, if I if I have a simple system which is uh, given by roots alpha one, alpha two, etc., up to alpha r, and then r is called the rank of my root system. Right? Remember these these guys form a basis of v. So it's the dimension of like the ambient space. And also, yeah, let me denote by i the 
indexing set one two all the way up to r okay and so today i want to start by talking about a related concept which is not uh, not obviously related but it's uh, turns out to be related and it's called coxter groups and so I guess uh, yeah, I should point you to this to another analyst paper where these groups were introduced. It was quite a while ago, and so the definition is very simple. Let's forget all we know about root systems for now. It's just an abstract group defined by uh, generators and relations. Definition: W is a Coxeter group if uh, it has a presentation on the following form. So it has some set of generators. W is generated by a bunch of SIs, just some abstract elements. And then the condition is that whenever I have two elements SISJ, then I have some number MIJ such that, well, I kind of specify the order of any product of two elements for all i and j in my indexing set. Oops. Okay, and so uh, I have to I have to say a few things about what what these mijs can be. So um, first, mii is always required to be one. So s so SI uh, times SI is equal to the identity. So in other words, SI is an involution for all I in all Coxter groups. And the other condition is that uh, the M, this M matrix is symmetric. MJI and so for I Equal for i not equal to j, uh, m i j belongs to the set of integers two, three, etc. Uh, union with infinity. So in some cases, you it's allowed, even though we are not going to have that. It's allowed to have this m i j to be infinite, in which case uh, there is no relation. Infinite means no relation on mij okay and so in principle that's it you can start choose some matrix which has some infinite entries and just start generating all possible products of SIs and sjs and, and etc modular these relations all right so that's basically uh, that's basically the whole definition any questions on the definition So, so now you can ask a question like, what, uh, which Coxter groups are finite? We are always kind of similar to cluster algebras. There you can start with a quiver. Here you can start with the, with this M matrix and do the ask the same question like, which Coxeter groups are finite? And so far, this looks completely different from what we had before, right? You just start with an abstract thing, and then you, um, well, ask the same question. But the answer is that um, Coxter groups are pretty much the same thing as reflection groups. So theorem, um, theorem is that um, suppose I choose a, a finite reflection group. So uh, let W be a finite reflection group and phi the corresponding root system. And then uh, what you do is you choose a simple a set of simple roots. 
delta alpha 1, alpha 2, etc., alpha r inside phi, doesn't matter which one, and then you let uh, m i j just denote the order of the corresponding product as i s j in w. So you have your two reflections, w is finite, therefore, uh, or I mean, the same thing works for infinite. This, if w is infinite, then you just, if the order is infinite, then you can set m i j to be infinite. And that's it. So th then, uh, then the conclusion is that uh, W is a Coxeter group. So in other words, uh, if you only require that the order of each SI SISJ is, is as in your reflection group, so only for these simple reflections. Then, first of all, they generate the whole W. And second of all, you don't get any new relations. Kind of all the relations are generated by these pairs as i as j. And also, the fact that it si is an involution, any reflection is an involution. So uh, yeah, and the moreover. The converse is also true. Conversely, any finite Coxeter group arises this way. Okay, so that's nice. So we have some other uh, interpretation of the same object as before. Let me try to give you an example. Well, actually, let me. Uh, before I give an example, let me, the example is going to be pretty nice, but before that I want to uh, introduce a couple more things, definitions. So uh, suppose that I have an element W inside of my Coxeter group. Uh, let W be inside W, then um, a reduced expression for W is uh, a product, so W is equal to SI1 times SI2, etc. SIR, oh, sorry, IL, let's say. So it's an expression like this of minimal possible length. So you try to express W in as little, uh, as few generators as possible. And then the, this number here, like the number of generators, uh, is called the length of W. Of W. So every element in the Coxeter group has a length, which is the minimal possible number of simple generators you need. Okay, and yeah, I guess that's uh, that's where I uh, yeah, and also the longest element, right? Uh, any finite Coxeter group W has a unique longest element which is denoted W naught, longest element. Okay, so now uh, it has a unique kind of shortest element, which is the identity, and also the unique longest element, which is kind of on the opposite side. And so, yeah, let me try to, let me try to ask you for an explanation in type a n minus one. So uh, yeah, let's say what are the generators? What is S1, what is S2, uh, and etc.
and what is uh, what is the the Coxeter group in this case. Yeah, so let me remind you that the uh, the simple roots. Does anybody remember the simple roots in this case? Yeah, right, but which ones are the simple ones? Yeah, okay, yeah, that's good, thank you. So this, the simple roots are E1 minus E2, E2 minus E3, etc. E N minus 1 minus E N. So this was alpha 1, alpha 2, um, all the way up to alpha N minus 1. And now, uh, so what happens if I apply the corresponding reflections? Yeah, I think I think I uh, mentioned last time what is W, uh, what is the whole reflection group in this case. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because yeah, right. So uh, yeah, thank you. That's exactly correct. So the point is that S alpha. Well, okay. So if you take S e one e minus e two, let's say uh, that that would be S S one. Uh, S1, uh, which is the same as S alpha 1, it permutes positions 1 and 2. So in other words, S1 of some beta, uh, some vector beta is equal to beta 2, comma beta 1, beta 3, etc., beta n. Right, and so uh, the the Coxeter group is indeed Sn, right? The symmetric group of permutations of n elements, and the generators are just the simple transpositions, the adjacent transpositions, one, two, two, three, all the way up to n minus one, comma n. Is that clear, or uh, is there any questions about this? Okay, because uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask more questions. So, well, or I guess I'm gonna give examples. So the kind of let me try to see if if we can understand these M I J's. Right. So what is what is M I I? Yeah, I see one. Yeah, that's true. So, thank you. If MII is equal to one, why, why is that? Yes, because as as I squared, it, when you reflect twice, you get back to the original. So that's true, and that is consistent with the uh, with the one of the axioms for the Coxeter group. Okay. Now, uh, what is what is m i j for i not equal to j?
Uh, okay. Uh, okay, two, two or three, four. Yeah, wh which one? Or maybe in, in Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's exactly correct. So, no, sorry, that's uh, almost correct. So, okay, it's uh, it's going to be either two or three, and so, uh, okay, what what does it mean that m i j is equal to two? That means that s i s j squared is equal to the identity. So, in other words, s s i. Um, S i s j s i s j is the identity, and because these are involutions, you can actually kind of cancel them. You, m you can move them from right to the left, from left to right. And so s i s j becomes equal to s j s i. Right. So when m i j is two, means that they commute. And so when do two such transpositions commute? Well, these two the two adjacent ones don't commute. So the answer is 2 if uh, i and j are not adjacent and 3 if i and j are adjacent. All right, so 3, what does 3 mean? Uh, m i j equals to 3 means that uh, And S i S j, well, let me even say that j is i plus one. S i is i plus one. S i is equal to S i plus one. S i S i plus one. So there is six terms total, which is S i S j squared. S i S j cubed is equal to the identity. All right. Um, so. Yeah, let me actually move. All right. Yeah. So okay, now let's say uh, W is a is an element of my group. What is the length of W in terms of permutations? Yeah, thank you. That's uh, that is also correct. So the length of W is the number of inversions of W, and that's not uh, that's not immediately obvious, I would say, right? But but I mean, it's if you write W as S I one, S I two, etc., S I L, then what happens is that if you can kind of you can think of if you start, let's say here. Uh, yeah, let me even. So, for example, here I have these one, two, three, up to n. They are kind of ordered, and then as I apply one transposition, I permute two adjacent entries. And so here, there are going to be there is going to be one inversion, and then as I keep going, I'm I'm always kind of certain the. Yeah, I guess if I uh, if I end up here, it's going to be like w of one, w of two, etc., w of n, and so yeah, if I traverse this backwards, then uh, I'm going to always I'm going to sort w uh, in the kind of the in an optimal way, right? Because a reduced expression means the minimal possible number of generators. So what you do is you f you find two entries which are adjacent and out of order, and then you swap them. And you keep doing that until your until your permutation is the identity. All right. Okay. And now I think. Uh, all right. The next question is. The next question is, uh, what is the longest element? Yeah, thank you. So it's the in one line notation. Yeah, it's the permutation that sends one to n, 
2 to n minus 1, etc., etc., and sends n to 1. So it kind of just reverses the order. So it has uh, the maximal possible number of inversions, which is yeah, sn just 2. Okay, and so now I don't know if this, if this whole picture looks familiar to you or not, but um, so if you ask, yeah, let me ask you this. Uh, if I look at reduced expressions, expressions for W naught, what do they correspond to that we have talked about in this class? There should be some objects that we have seen before that somehow are, well, in bijection with reduced expressions. Or maybe not bijection, but some kind of correspondence. What's the combination of what? Okay, yeah. Uh, no, I think, yeah, it, it's a different. It, it was a while, a while back. Yeah, let's say I choose some, let's say I take S3. Can somebody tell me a reduced expression of W naught in S3? Yeah, yeah, so what what would be the reduced one? Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's correct. So, so in terms of the SIs, what would that be? Uh, I think there is no S3, right? There is. That's correct. S1, S2, S1. Right, so I start with, let's say, 1, 2, and 3. And then I, S1 means I swap 1 and 2. That's S1. And then I swap 2 and 3. That's S2. And then I swap uh, 1 and 3. And so I get 1, 2, 3. And that's W naught. Okay. Is there any other reduced expression for W not in S3? Okay, thank you. Right, the other one is S2, S1, S2. And so the corresponding picture would be 1, 2, 3. S2, S1, S2, S2, S1, S2. Okay. Uh, 
now let me go back to this question does uh, does this ring any bells okay yeah so this is uh, braid mode and so yeah i mean that's correct so uh in more generally the braid move is like si si plus one si si plus one si si plus one and these two things are uh, wiring diagrams Uh, well, I mean, so in the braid group, okay, that's a good question. In the braid group, you have, well, you draw these braids, which are kind of like this, maybe, maybe you draw something like this. So you think of these kind of, uh, of these wires as actual ropes in space, but then, uh, in the braid group, if you write as i squared, then that's going to be a braid that looks uh, like this. So it's not the identity. So as i squared does it cancel out with itself, and so uh, and that's why I draw these kind of wires, just flat intersections. And so as you so basically in a in a reduced expression, you can never have, uh, you can never apply braid moves to find this SI squared, because then you can reduce the length and then uh, the thing you had is not going to be reduced, right? And so the point is that uh, reduced expressions are basically, uh, basically almost exact, or let's say exactly correspond to the wiring diagrams that we studied with respect to the flag variety. Uh, do you remember, do you remember the wiring diagrams? Okay. All right, yeah, so uh, I just want I mean, I'm not gonna use it uh, here too much, but I just wanted to, uh, I think it's nice that, that I'm doing something else, but then it goes back to these wiring diagrams somehow. Uh, yeah, anyway, and let me also mention another nice and useless for us result. Uh, so you can ask a question, what is the number of all reduced decompositions for W naught in SN? For example, here, uh, for S3, the answer is two reduced expressions. Uh, but what happens for general N? There is a sequence. Is there a formula? That's nice. And the answer turns out to be that there is a very nice formula. So let me state this is a theorem which is due to Stanley. Uh, Stanley 84. So the theorem is that the number, the number of reduced expressions for W naught in SN equals the number of standard young tableau tableau of staircase shape and I haven't defined these objects in my class yet, but uh, let me also mention that it, I'm, I'm going to define them a bit later, but 
uh, let me mention that the, the, the number of such objects, standard yanta below staircase shape, has a simple formula. Also equal to, so you take n choose 2 factorial and divide by these odd powers 1 to the n minus 1, 3 to the n minus 2, 5 to the okay, 5 to the n minus 3, etc., up to 2 to the up to 1, up to 2n minus 3 to the first power. So even if you don't know what these are, uh, still, still it's a nice combinatorial result. Like product formula for a number of reduced expressions. So for example, when n is equal to 3, what is uh, 3 just 2 factorial divided by, by 1 squared times 3 to the first, and that's it. So what is 3 just 2 factorial? Six. Uh, 6 divided by 3, that's 2. So that's the correct answer. And so, okay, what are these uh, standard Yan tableau of staircase shape? Well, yeah, let me show you an example. So standard Yan tableau are also called, are abbreviated as SYT. And so, uh, yeah, let me even kind of zoom out. So SYT of staircase shape. I'm just going to draw an example and it's going to be clear. So you take, you draw a staircase shape. Is this too much? Yeah, maybe this. Uh, yeah, n just 2. n just 2 is 3, but then I take factorial. So, yeah, and just 2 factorial is a weird number. You don't see that very often, right? Uh, it grows very, very fast. Yeah, okay, so uh, here is an, uh, here is, so this shape is the staircase shape. And it's, uh, so in our case, it's gonna, there is gonna be uh, n minus 1 is gonna be the height, and, and the width is also gonna be n minus 1. And then uh, a standard Yan tableau is what you do is you fill fill these cells by by numbers, and the numbers have to increase right and down. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, where fifteen is n choose two in this case. And that's it. So the condition is that entries increase uh, this way and this way. And the entries entries are integers uh, 1, 2, like all integers between 1 and n choose 2. Is that clear? Uh, all right. So how many standard Yan tableau for n equals to 3? OK, yeah, so the staircase shape uh, has three boxes. And you can either put 1, 2, 3, or you can put one, uh, two, three, like this. And so, so the answer is two, and that's this two is the same two as this two. From the yeah. the, so the theorem is saying that for all n, uh, one number is equal to the, to the other number and is equal to the third number. For example, you can compute the the next the n equals to four by hand and make sure I'm not lying to you. And you can also you can think. Uh, I mean, it's a hard exercise, but uh, okay, hard 
exercise you can try to find a bijection so I give you like what what would be a reduced expression of w naught that corresponds to this standard Young tableau there should be some bijection and actually there is a pretty nice one you can you can google that as well if you're interested yeah. but that's basically it uh, if you have any questions let me know Yeah, otherwise, let me, uh, okay, I have six minutes. All right, yeah, let me at least, uh, let me at least start talking about crystallographic root systems. So, um, Previously, I've been talking about usual root systems, but the crystallographic ones are the important ones. So um, I'm going to mention later why they are really that important. But so far, uh, let me first of all so recall that we have this formula for S alpha of beta, right? So let's say alpha and beta are just two vectors. And then what is the formula for the reflection of beta with respect to alpha? Does anybody remember? Okay, thank you. Yeah, that is correct. And so now the condition, the condition, so definition, a root system is called crystallographic. If this integer here, uh, well, if this number here is an integer, twice alpha dot beta, divided by alpha comma alpha is an integer for all roots for all pairs alpha and beta inside my root system which I, okay this condition sounds weird but it's important and so uh, because well if phi is crystallographic then w phi is called a while group and that's i mean yeah, that's th all of these things are in connections to lie algebras and yeah basically uh, the comment why why this crystallographic condition is important is that uh, such objects these crystallographic root systems classify classify all kinds of different stuff so classify li semi simple uh, yeah let's say semi simple li algebras and uh, yes yeah, compact li groups and i don't know singularities uh, plane curve singularities and etc. So there somehow uh, there is many many uh, different types of objects which are all classified by uh, by crystallographic root systems. And you yeah, actually classifying the Lie groups, so let's say, was already very important, like a very important achievement of mathematics in twentieth century. Um, Yeah, and so I'm not going to explain how. Yeah, if you, if you haven't ta ever taken a class on Lie groups or Lie algebras, I highly recommend. That's a lot of interesting stuff. 
this side here. If you want to understand how uh, this condition follows from there, then uh, I really suggest taking the Lie algebra class. Okay, and so and so. Okay, one minute left. Yeah, let me just stop here because uh, then I'm, uh, it's it's better to just do the whole thing next time. Any yeah? Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, that, that's actually a great question. And so in the original paper of Stanley, he uh, wrote that uh, this is um, true for the symmetric group, and then which is type A. And there is also type B, where he had some conjectures. I think those conjectures have been proven. But in general, I think it's, I mean, it, it has been studied quite a while, but I don't think there is a nice answer for arbitrary let's say finite Coxeter groups, which, which have been classified and probably the answer is known for all of them, but I don't think it's as nice as this one. Yeah, thank you. But I mean, generally, yeah, whenever you have, let's say, a result for the symmetric group, it, it's a good industry to kind of try to generalize it to other finite Coxeter groups. People do that a lot, they write papers, Whenever th that's a there is a result that's cool enough, you know, about some Catalan numbers, people generalize Catalan numbers to other root systems, which we're going to discuss as well, and yeah, etc. Any other questions? I think it should be all easy. Uh, yeah, there is there is a thing that I'm gonna not gonna explain, but basically you can, given a reduced expression, where is it? Yeah, given a reduced expression like this, you can just write down the inversions of W explicitly, uh, and th this is going to be some subset of roots. Of positive roots, and so W not corresponds to the case where the set of inversions is all is all the positive roots, and yeah, so it, it basically kind of sends positive roots to negative roots, but in a in an interesting way. So yeah, yeah, I mean the inversions of, of, of this permutation here are you know all possible pairs, and the positive roots are. You know, the inversions are all pairs i less than j, and the positive roots are all roots e i minus e j, where i is less than j. And so, uh, yeah, anyway, in general, it's not too hard if you know how to assign inversions to, assign roots to inversions, and etc. But I don't know, if without any theory, it's going to be easy. Any other questions? I mean, the class is over. I'm already over time. So feel free to leave. If you have any questions, let me know. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, if you know about the Brewer or well, uh, the strong Brewer order is, uh, I think the weak one is the, is the lattice, but the strong one isn't. Or am I, am I con confused? Yeah. Um, but either way, yeah, W naught is maximal in both in the strong order and in the weak order. And Brewer order works for arbitrary uh, Coxeter groups. Yeah, there is, there is a nice book. Do I? Very good. Combinatorics of Coxeter groups, and by Bjorner and Brenty, and there is, it, it just starts with the Brewer order and the longest element, and it proves all these things. Yeah, it's it's easy to do this, uh, to develop this theory like one 
exercise by one, but if I just give you a question about the real order, it's, it's going to be hard.